From Los Angeles, the home of film and television, this is Film Music Live, a webcast featuring outstanding composers, orchestrators, filmmakers, and more from the world of music for film, television, and video games, talking about their work and answering your questions. Film Music Live is sponsored by the Film Music Network and Film Music Institute. And now the host of Film Music Live, Daniel Schweiger. Hey everyone, I'm Daniel Schweiger, and welcome to Film Music Live, the show where you get to ask the questions to today's top composers and a director. I'm happy to have you here. One of the most sleazily diabolical and clever time-tripping horror anthologies in the making has got to be X and Pearl. Viewers may have thought they were going to get a singularly adult letter rating when they came to this strikingly ghastly and humorous mix of sex and violence as a group of porn makers and actors converge on a Texas farm where the elderly Pearl's sexual frustration creates a body count to get her husband's libido back. Marking the second collaboration after the unholy sacrament between director Ty West and composer Tyler Bates, who's no stranger to playing maniacs with the likes of Rob Zombie's Halloween and The Devil's Rejects, what was even more unnerving than the weirdly rustic, erotically cooing, sometimes screaming and altogether unhinged avant-garde scoring approach to X was the surprise epilogue that showed we'd be traveling back from 1979 and a very dead Pearl to her psychotic origin story in 1918. Now on board for this even more twisted ride is Bates's frequent collaborator, Tim Williams, a conductor and an additional composer with him on the likes of Guardians of the Galaxy and TV's Exorcist series, as well as Williams' own composing on Brightburn and We Summon the Darkness. The difference between X's unnerving sound and the lavish, spot-on salute to Bernard Herrmann and Max Steiner couldn't be more apparent for a young woman filled with gauzy Hollywood daydreams that get rent asunder by her murderous passions. With West's diabolically transgressive imagination and the horse-savvy licks of Bates and Williams, the critically applauded X and Pearl stand out as two marvelously seditious slashers, no more so than with the two scores' musical difference between blunt instruments and a gorgeously melodic orchestra. And now here are the people who have taken us back in time with lethally ironic desire and unhinged nostalgia. Writer-director Ty West, ex-composer Tyler Bates, and Pearl's co-composer Tim Williams. Welcome to Film Music Live, everyone. Good to see you, Daniel. Oh, thanks for having us. Thank you so much. Well, I guess, Ty, my first question is to you. I mean, I have just never seen, you know, when you when you think of horror, you automatically kind of think of sex, death, and violence, but never quite like this. How did this idea to spring and the idea that you do it as a trilogy? Well, it started in a very strange way. I mean, we were, we were heading down to New Zealand to make X, um, and it was just going to be one movie. Um, but it was at the peak of the pandemic, and New Zealand was a safe place to make a movie, and we had a crew, and we had people we were traveling in and we had visas and we were spending all this time, effort and money to build an entire infrastructure to make a movie at a time where you really couldn't make a movie anywhere else in the world. And it felt like to me, we were so fortunate to be able to do that, that, you know, it'd be such a shame to finish that movie, tear everything down and go home because who knows if we'd ever get the chance again. So I started to think about, well, how could we make two movies and how could we make the best use of everything we already have down there? And um, I didn't want to make a sequel to X because I didn't want just more people going to the same farm and getting killed. That didn't seem like a particularly interesting movie. But I had cast Mia Goth to play Pearl in X, and we had been spending a lot of time talking about her character because in X, we meet her very late in her life, and she's the villain in the movie, and we don't get a lot of specifics about you know what happened to her prior to this story. But we had been talking a lot about all of those things because she was playing the character, and you want to have that information so that she has it to perform with. And it occurred to me that if we went backwards and we made that movie, we could use, we could amortize a lot of the costs, use a lot of the same, you know, crew and and cast and 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 resources that we had. And the question was just, is there a movie there? And so I went to New Zealand and I had to do two weeks of mandatory quarantine and uh, to get into the country. And during that time, I figured if we could crank out a script in those two weeks that could convince A24 this was a good idea, not just a cost-effective idea, but also a creatively good idea, then maybe we could make two movies back to back. And so that was kind of the challenge we set up for ourselves, Mia and I. And I, you know, I called her to make sure she'd be willing to stay, and I wanted to know if she would want to collaborate 
from the you know the conception of the idea since she was Pearl. Without her, there was no Pearl movie, and um, she was very excited about both. And so, in those two weeks, um, we would FaceTime. She was in New York, I was in New Zealand, and we would FaceTime and frantically write a script to try to convince A24 that this was a good idea. And at the same time, I sort of pitched them the third movie idea, which they liked, and they were interested in doing that. But for me, the third idea was only compelling as a third idea, not as a second idea. So for me, it felt like it was only worth doing the uh, the, the third movie if it, if it was number three and not number two. So anyway, that's all happened in a very short period of time, like over the course of you know two and a half, three weeks. And by some miracle, uh, A24 was completely on board and convinced, and they they bet on us in the movie, and they uh, they greenlit Pearl before we even shot X. So we made the two movies back to back. So, Tyler, your first work with uh, Ty was on The Sacrament. Uh, Ty, what clued you into Tyler's music? We had a mutual friend. I was aware. I heard all his stuff and liked it. And we had a mutual friend, um, James Gunn, and and he introduced us. And um, I just was always kind of a fan. And I said, hey, you think he's around for this? And I think it was one of those email or text intros. And we met up and we talked about the movie. And, and I don't know if we were pretty much off to the races. So, Tyler, you know, before you worked with uh, Ty, had, did you check out his movies? And again, Ty was a, a big fan of this kind of slow burn style that you had, like in The, the Innkeepers and House of the Devil. Uh, what was it about uh, Ty's films that stuck out to you? Well, House of the Devil, uh, the tone of that movie really struck a chord with me, um, probably because I not only had a heightened curiosity about uh, – paranormal and supernatural uh, energies, but I really felt that he captured something there that felt authentic. And um, right away, I just, I, I recognized his sensibilities as a director and, and his talent level just there alone. And so obviously when we were introduced, I was, I was keen to, to see what Ty was about and what he wanted to do. And then the story of the sacrament um, is something that I think is extremely compelling. Uh, there are aspects of that movie that are pervasive through culture, throughout culture right now. And it, it's something that uh, interested me very much. And then that it was a, a great challenge to do that movie because it's a movie that was made in a sort of an impressionistic uh, documentary style. Uh, so the score uh, was, the approach was not simply like a, a movie that, you know, normal movie, it had to straddle, uh, you know, kind of a documentary style and a cinematic scope uh, simultaneously. So the challenge was really intriguing. And then once I met Ty, I could clearly recognize how uh, much he understood his own storytelling and how he wanted to, to approach it. So I love that when a, when a director is that attuned to, not only their storytelling and what their point is, but also the process. And, you know, while Ty is very articulate, he also leaves a, a, a great deal of latitude for interpretation of an idea. So he knows exactly what he wants to feel, but there are also uh, many ways to get there. So the conversations always, you know, we can share uh, our thoughts about things that have inspired us throughout time. But the conversation about music is very uh, insular or holistic as far as the movie's concerned. So we're not really referencing um, the movie that's in the theater that's been making the money this week. <laughs> so it, it makes you, it, it really empowers you as a filmmaker to be involved in projects like that. And, and Ty stayed very true to that uh, since the day I met him. And Tim, you've been working with Tyler for quite a bit. Uh, tell, how, how did you guys uh, start uh, get, getting this great synergy going on? It was a really interesting um, coincidence. Uh, I had moved over from England and uh, literally bought our, in my first house. And I was you know heading down to the end of the driveway. And in England, when you meet your neighbor, it's usually like, what do you do? And they're like, oh, I'm a chartered accountant or, you know, a lawyer or something fairly <clears throat> relaxed. And uh, he said, I'm a composer. And I was like, it was very strange for me, you know, because that's not 
what we had you'd have in England. So I was like, well, I'm a composer as well. So <clears throat> we we were literally neighbors, and um, I originally started doing some orchestral music, and that was kind of very loud and heading over the fence. And I can't remember which film you were working on, but you were working on something that was also loud, and the music was kind of <laughs> <laughs> the devil's rejects, which was <laughs> contrary. So. so um yeah there was a lot of sort of music going back and forth over the fence and, and and tyler was like um you know would you uh you know would you be interested in orchestrating uh one of my upcoming projects um so that that was how we met and started working together and uh i, I think that was 18 years ago or something like that at least no, i think 2001 or two but yeah. the yeah tim and i used to play on each other's music or you know, uh, suggest ideas through through playing on each other's cues sometimes. Uh, just to, if we were stuck or we needed something, you know, um, Tim would hand me the hard drive over the fence. Hey, can you play on this Disney song? And then I, you know, say, Hey, here is a, a sequence of film where uh, people are getting murdered and I need to do a horn session for this. <laughs> so <laughs> how would you feel about, uh, you know, orchestrating something for a session tomorrow? <laughs> it was kind of like that. Uh, but we've been through it all, and it's been a, a tremendous experience uh, together. Now, you know, one thing that really struck me about X, it was how seditious it was. I mean, usually you, 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 you usually don't even have normal films about sex where you see old people having sex at all. It's almost like uh, for, for, forbidden. But X really, again, kind of breaks that barrier. But in the context, again, of the Pearl and her husband watching these young people having sex, and then it, it bloodily refires their own libidos. Uh, Ty, what kind of music did you hear for this? And what was the, the kind of creative process like with uh, Tyler to, to get the sound? Um, it was interesting because with X, um, I had a sort of a conceptual idea before I, I had a specific idea in the sense that I really wanted it to be a vocal driven score. And that was our first conversation is that I was like, I think that the sort of the, the lead of this should be driven by a, vo a female vocal because it felt in tune with the, with the concept of the movie and it felt like um, not just a haunting sound, but it just felt like a unique sound. And I didn't want in any way X to sound like, you know, the majority of horror movies have been coming out lately. And a way to do that was to do something stripped down and vocal driven. And so that was our first conversation. And I, Tyler immediate was like, oh, I've been working with this great artist named Chelsea Wolf. And that, that's kind of how that began. But it was always meant to try to be, to try to get away from the familiar stings and the familiar, um, you know, sort of like, horror bed sounding stuff and to try to do something that was kind of teetering between ambience and then um these sort of very loud organic like humanistic type sounds and that felt like an exciting idea and something fresh i mean again how how what was it like recording those voices tyler i mean again it, it's really erotic and strange and weird and it, it almost reminded me of michael small's score for clute which is a big compliment that i can give it yeah uh, thank you i'll take it um but although i don't suggest that i belong in the same sentence but um chelsea and i had gotten to know each other pretty well uh working uh on a, a soundtrack album that i did for dc comics kind of during COVID, and she had expressed uh, her desire to to ex to explore something in film at some point and it was really just kismet as far as all that timing was concerned. And I, you know, had come to know the depth of an artist that she is. So the type of concepts that the Ty and I were discussing, I mean, Chelsea was very much uh, not only open to exploring them, but very eager to do so. And it took us a little bit uh, of time to experiment and find some of the, the gestures and the approaches that uh that felt uh natural with the movie because we are in that film we're we're kind of in a uh, in a, in a subconscious state of mind musically a lot of the time um not necessarily just doubling down on on what we're seeing and with chelsea i i she has such a dynamic range as an artist and as a singer i was thinking that we should 
use her voice as a percussion instrument, um, use her breaths because she has such a very interesting sound. I mean, I just listened to the sonority of, of her voice and, and that really was what clued me in on a, a number of the approaches that I had asked her to explore. And then, you know, we did have a couple in-person sessions that were, were uh, really great as well. So this is just trial and error and, and it's being, it's working with, you know, somebody she was comfortable enough with me to divulge herself to the explore, exploration. Uh, we had to go to a second level. You can't just call a singer in like you hear on a lot of big movies, you know, they're the one of the last things in the score and they come in and do the oohs and ahs and all the ambient stuff. We wanted to go much deeper and really get into the character of, of Pearl and have a, a true connection between all the vocal ideas, the, the, the motifs, the thematic ideas, uh, have that really connected to her in a way that was visceral as much as it was thematic for the film and again this brings us to a completely different musical approach for pearl which brings us to our first question uh, from louis uh, virginelli um i really enjoyed pearl's main title how did the idea come about to compose it as a sweeping romantic title and i guess that question goes to you ty and to to tim i mean this astounding completely different uh marriage of Dimitri Chiamkin, Max Steiner, Bernard Herrmann. I mean, it, it's amazing how spot on that sound is for the for uh, Pearl. Well, I didn't know if Pearl was going to happen for a while. And then once I found out it was going to happen and I knew we were going to commit to this sort of uh, golden age of Hollywood type melodrama vibe. Um, and, you know, X was a movie that was very influenced and affected by and the characters were um, influenced by 1970s Americana, avant-garde, experimental exploitation filmmaking. And, and that has nothing to do with Pearl. Pearl was very much a story about someone who had ambitions and dreams and looked at the glitz and glamor of a life that she wanted to have. And so to me, um, having her be affected by cinema was less about making movies and more about like the feeling that, that movies give you as far as an idea of what your life could be and what they show you. And so, you know, it became very obvious early on that it needed to have, um, you know, a big orchestral thing. Now, that was a new idea from when we were talking about making two movies, we hadn't even got as far ahead to even talk about that. So when Tyler and I first talked about doing two movies, the second movie, I don't know if we assumed it would be more of the same, but we certainly weren't initially talking about it would be a big orchestral thing. But as soon as the movie got greenlit, and as soon as the movie started to come together, it became apparent basically by the images that we were photographing that like, it's going to need something that is a, a, a real significant character in the movie and, and speaks to that vibe. And so I called Tyler and said like, okay, I think we're gonna have to go you know, bigger on this one and in, in a more you know, romantic orchestral approach and, and credit to Tyler who just immediately was excited by it and was not, I mean, I, you may have been, you may have seemed daunting when you first thought about it, but you didn't let on to me. Um, you were, you just seemed excited and ready to go. And so it felt like a fun challenge and it felt like something also that for the two of us and then the three of us, it, we may do something like it again, but probably never to the specificity that this was. And it seemed like a really cool opportunity to really go for it. And that was the fun of these movies is to try to lean into doing something that um, nobody else is doing right now and to try to really, you know, as I guess as artists, you know, get to play around in something that maybe we all feel like we can do, but don't always get the opportunity to do. Tim, what, what, how did you come about that approach? Or, I mean, it, again, it's so amazingly spot on, uh, you know, this evocation that you guys got. Well, I believe, uh, as Ty had expressed to me, that it, it began almost as an experiment to see if the movie would work um, with that approach. Because, I, you know, the movie, compared to anything I've seen in years, is completely unique. And... Um, you know, Ty started experimenting even, I, I believe, when you, you had some dailies to take a look at, just to feel if that would be a viable approach to the score. And that was an initial conversation. And then once it was on, it was like, OK, uh, here's what we want to do. And we have, like, literally no time to do it. So I'm like, all right, man. I said, you know, if it's cool with you, I think the only way to make this happen um, especially because I, I also had a tour in the, in the spring, uh, was, was to call Tim. And Tim and I love working together. And, you know, I'm 
a huge fan anyway. And I think over the years we've managed to just get inside of each other's heads so much that that we have a great symbiosis in our work process or communications and understanding the syntax of what we're approaching so that the anything that we do uh together still has a very synchronous congruous sound um i love approaching you know i love writing music of of that style tim is masterful with it and uh i would definitely say you know uh carried the a pretty heavy end of the furniture on it, um, especially with the orchestrations and conducting um, and managing to to make the score in the recording sound so authentic and fantastic, given our limited time and resources. Um, it was really exciting to see it all come together. We had our, our moments of trepidation, but Tim can elaborate specifically uh, on his experience. Elaborate, Tim. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, uh, c credit to to Ty because he was very um, clear about what he wanted. And, you know, Tyler and I, when we first heard the concept, were sort of sitting there going, Are you 100% sure about this direction? And he was like, yep. So um, at that point, it was, you know, the gauntlet was thrown down. And, and it, it, you know, it's obviously a, a huge challenge to try and emulate that those beautiful scores from the golden era of Hollywood. Um, but that was the, that was the challenge. So we, we kind of dug in and we knew we wanted some, uh, a, just a very strong theme that, that we could then take and work through the, the movie in different ways to cover different, um, moments, different emotions. So, uh, we, once we finished the kind of the theme, we sent it over to, to Ty as kind of a proof of concept and something like this, something in this direction. And, um he really seemed to respond to it and uh and, and gave us a tremendous amount of freedom and encouragement to just keep keep going and and dig into that style um and it, it's one of those things that that we're both huge fans of that style of scoring it's just you don't get that opportunity very often to to take a theme and really run with it through a whole through a whole film and and to really dig into themes to dig into the colors of uh, that, that kind of writing, the harmonies, the language, even down to the orchestration, where you you know you have the three low clarinets and contrabassoons and uh, really great woodwind voicings and things like that that are so distinct from that time, and even things like the portamento uh, where they you know connect all the string phrases. Uh, it's just a style that's kind of um, you know it's it's just not used anymore. So uh you know it, it was really for us a huge dream and an opportunity to create something that we we uh you know always love love that as as uh, as people who love film music yeah and, and one thing daniel uh, that is extremely extremely rare um that is a huge aspect to the success of the score achieving its goal is that not only is Ty, a great writer and director, he's an excellent editor. So the editing was key and we worked with a locked picture. So you, you can't really do a score with this much music with a singular theme permeating the entire film if you're getting a new cut of the picture every day or every three days or what have you. And I've noticed it in my own music sometimes when I go back and watch something years later, it's like, okay, there were things that were were chopped up, you know, after it was written or recorded, and it doesn't flow as it was naturally intended to do. And that's one thing I was really taken by. My wife and I went and saw this in the theater Saturday, and it was just, it flowed so beautifully, and it was, it was presented exactly as it was conceptualized and intended to play. And I thought that that really lent uh, a tremendous amount of strength to that dimension of the film was having that music just feel so natural in the way it, it laid into the movie. Um, that is so rare, especially in, you know, I've done a lot of action movies. Those are changing by the hour usually. So it's a different, a different thing, you know, 15, 20 years ago, you might run into a lock picture and then, you know, you can do some really incredible things with that. And you can count on that picture staying steady. So you can really dive deep 
into your work and into your writing. Um, and, you know, I thank Ty for being such a, a strong filmmaker, understanding the process enough to, to know what the, like the ramifications uh, are on the score if the picture is constantly moving. You know, it makes it so tremendously difficult for us to provide the score that's appropriate for a movie, especially like this, which is so lyrical. Um, I think it's really uh, an aspect of filmmaking that the average person doesn't really have an awareness of and how that does impact our work. But it was such a joy to work on a movie with a locked picture and X for the most part, you know, once we got into the nitty gritty also was, was locked. So I think well, I mean, the, the experience was great, you know, musically for us. It was so fun. Well, I mean, talk about nostalgia. That brings us to a question from Ivan Sorkin. Uh, the main title theme sounds so golden age, just wow. Question for all three of you. So what is the favorite, your favorite golden age soundtracks and which golden age composers inspired you for Pearl? You know, for me, I don't know uh, if there was a specific thing. Um, for me, it's sort of that era, and it's as sort of as Tim was saying, it's a lot of instruments beyond just the or orchestra of it all. But there's certain instruments that you just never hear anymore. And for some of my favorite films, like they give a feeling and they give a familiarity to the, that era of filmmaking and those type movies and that type of cinema. And it was just really like a treat to kind of, whether it be clarinets and bassoons and things like that, to just to have a movie where like that tone could could come through again is is i mean i don't know if I, maybe we'll do it again sometime but it's it's highly likely that we won't and so it was a real pleasure to get to do that and to give the movie an identity in a way that felt to me like a classic and i'm just lucky to have gotten to do that so i mean you know certainly the composers you mentioned in bernard Harp, these are all people that i'm aware of and they're all brilliant um and there's you know so many great scores but it was more just about the 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 feeling of feeling not modern and, and feeling like a, something that was properly scored to picture and it's going on what Tyler said with locking picture. I always try to do that because I think, you know, especially in this movie, it, it was the kind of score that needed to be grandiose one moment and then small the next moment. And then there needed to be like a flourish of something when someone was specifically picking up a prop. Like it really needed to feel like the music was integrated into the picture like so intentionally. And, and that's what was something that was great about, about this kind of um, music in a movie. It's like you, you, even, even an audience who's not thinking about music can't help but think about it. And that was, that was fun. Tim and Tyler, what composers hit you of the past for Pearl? Strangely for me, um, John Barry is one of my huge heroes. I, I adore everything he did for Bond and I adore everything he did, he did for, you know, um, out of Africa and that whole, it dances with wolves, that whole shift. Um, so, you know, obviously, you know, Bernard Herrmann and Max Steiner and um, uh, Korngold are huge favorites. But for me, John Barry, there's even a, a deeper, there's something about John Barry's music that, that has always connected. Um, so that was definitely, you know, filtering in a little bit. Tyler, what what golden age composers for you uh, came to mind? Uh, these oh. guys, these guys have pretty pretty much hit all, all of the the high notes for me. You know, um, it, the list could go on, but it, as far as what's uh, relevant to this film, I would say that you know all all the references that Tim mentioned. I love John Barry as well, and and it's kind of makes me sad when we're having this specific part of this conversation because. I haven't been able to really apply woodwinds to anything I've done in this type mode since Watchmen, which was like 2009. Yeah. <laughs> and I love writing in that style. You know, some people just think, you know, I want to decapitate people in movies all the time, which is fun. <laughs> That's fun. We love it. And you, you get to, you, you don't think in Pearl you're going to get it, but boy, do you get it. <laughs> I mean, you know, what's great to me. It, I don't think it's a horror movie. I know it's how it's marketed. To me, it's like a, a psychodrama, you know, and what happens is horrific, you know, It's but it's tragic, you know? I mean, this is really a, a tragic tale about somebody that, uh, that we can empathize with for sure. Um, and I think that's one of the real strengths of this movie and X, you know? I don't think 
they sit alongside of the typical like horror slasher films. To me, they're just movies where these really bad things happen. <laughs> these really strange things happen, but it's, it's, that's why I personally connect to, to both of them so much. I really feel them as movies, not so like genre specific. And hopefully uh, with so many journalists starting to recognize the work that went into both of these movies by Ty and by Mia, I, I, I hope that they're recognized for making great movies. Um, it's very rare that, that a director or an actress would work together and have two movies come out in theaters in the same year and be so unique and, and excellent. So hopefully people will, will no, take a I, look at it from that perspective. I definitely think so. So we've got a question from TV Productions. How much creative control do you have over the style of the score in any movie you've made? And I guess, Ty, all three of you can answer, but Ty, maybe like how much creative control do you accede to the composers? Uh, you know, Tyler will have a better answer than I will, but I, I think, I mean, I'm certainly, I'd like to think pretty specific and I, I have, uh, you know, there's, there's things that I feel strongly about at times, but as Tyler said earlier, like my hope is to basically like, you know, set the stage for what I'm going for and try to map out what I think is important and then let, you know, Tyler and, and Tim get there in their own way. And, you know, the greatest thing for me is when they send something, I'm just like, great, this one's done, it nails it, you know? And usually, I, and again, the, you know, Tyler and Tim can, can probably articulate it better, but for me, most of my feedback is once there's something mocked up and we sort of drop it in the movie, it generally tends to be about like, maybe it's too early to do something like this, let's save this for later, or, there's a moment here where something happens on screen that I'd really love to be like really in sync with the music. So is there a way we can like, you know, create a hole here and then a, and a moment for this or, or something on a particular instrument and things like that, just to kind of make it feel like the two, the, the picture and the, the score and the, and the characters are really kind of dancing with one another, especially on this movie. That's most of what I think my feedback was, but it was also, um, you know, with this movie, I, I would, I don't think we didn't bounce stuff back and forth that much because um, you guys did a great job mocking it up and, and, you know, I would have some thoughts on things, but it was never like any sort of reinvent the wheel type stuff or anything that would really kind of, uh, knock the whole thing over from what we were doing. It was just a little bit like, it maybe gets a little too busy here. Could we hang back and just strip down to just the movements or could we go down to just the strings here? So that when we come back, it gives it, you know, some shape and things like that. And that was just me thinking from a story standpoint or from a, uh, you know, the overall movie characters arc standpoint of being like, let's save this moment for later and things like that. But it was, um, it's weird because I, I think in many ways, this was a, a harder challenge to score a movie this way because it's a bigger job in a way. But I find that the movies, movies tell you what works and what doesn't work. And they tell you pretty quickly and very specifically. So on X, it was harder to find the rhythm of the movie because the, the movie threw it back in our face a lot when it wasn't working. And then it, when it clicked, it clicked. I think Pearl clicked pretty early on. And then it was just a big workload to do it. Um, but yeah, the, the movie tends to tell you what it likes, you know, hopefully, you know, sooner than later in the process. And I think there was only one, uh, actually two, two cues that were sort of quite fun to, um, almost not create on the fly, but uh, the two the two dance sequences were ones where we had a general sense of the kind of arrangement we wanted. But um, uh, when we got to Nashville, um, you know, we, we recorded it in sections so that Ty could um, build it up. So, you know, the, with the, with the hot house rag cue, we started with just the piano and then we added the the strings and then we added the brass and we added the drums and the and, and everything separately so that that was something that ty had a very detailed uh involvement in where he could say let's let's hold let's hold off the brass till here and let's build it here and let's just have this part coming at the end so there was uh some some great collaborative moments where you know ty was hugely involved in in, in creating creating it and matching it to the film so we've got a question from Rolf. Um, could you speak a little bit more about the orchestra and the orchestration? Uh, how big was the orchestra and did you record in stems with everybody in the room? And I guess this would probably apply to Pearl as opposed to X, which I don't know if it had any orchestra in it. Yeah, so um, I, 
Tyler and I actually typically don't like recording in stems, and uh, and actually that's one of the things that uh, I, I love working with Tyler when we do, even when we're doing these bigger films, and we might have to stem out a little bit. We always like to have the full orchestra in the room play down the cue a few times, and then start to say, do, what do we need to strip out, if anything? And I just think it. I think musically, it always feels better if if musicians can hear each other and and play together. So uh, for uh, Pearl, we pretty much did it as all in the room, apart from those dance cues, which we did actually stem out to to give us a little bit of um, choice, you know, in in post. Uh, but yeah, most of what you're hearing <laughs> is all in the room live. But it's a much better way to do it because you can um, musicians just play better, I think. Yeah, and the harmonics of all the instruments. Uh, playing in that room at one time. I, I believe that with all music. The more the more musicians that can track simultaneously, the better the sound. To me, it's a, it, that that's the way to make classic music, whether you're making rock songs, a jazz record, or a film score. You start stripping it out, it starts to lean a little bit more into an application like sound design. Um, even though it is musical um, and there are tactical ways to go about, you know, approaching different, you know, different types of movies, different types of scenes. Um, this one is different though. And, and I, I must say, you know, working with Ty now on three movies. Uh, one of the great things is, is there, I think we, there was a question about how much freedom do we have? You know, Ty doesn't, if you looked at the movie, it's not a, and you considered it like a menu for a restaurant, it's not the spaghetti factory. So they're not 7,000 things on the menu. They're, it's a much more boutique-y kind of approach. And what we do is we try and be as creative within the parameters of, of a more narrow uh, concept, at least at, at, its, at, at its inception. That way we can really get lockstep in the collaborative process because Ty is very much involved in the development of the music. He feels the music, he understands the music and why there is music and what its point is. And so that makes it so much more interesting and fun uh, for us as composers to engage on that level and, and to feel the importance of the music, not just as wallpaper, but as a storytelling component and with in that process there's a much greater sense of how the music can help uh propel the story um as opposed to you know sometimes not having a great uh uh idea of what the motivation of music happens to be so we're involved engaged as filmmakers you know and and that makes the process so much more rewarding is an artist to to work uh, on that that plane with the director, especially like I said, you know, Ty writes, directs, edits, and I mean that in the best way. He's not a, a megalomaniac. <laughs> He's just very good at it. And I know I do the same thing when I'm working on records. You know, I mean, I I have to I can't just hand everything over to to people because it would dilute my point or my objective. And there is a way of collaborating with people, I think, that really brings out their strengths. And that's what's exciting about working with Ty on all the movies we've done. Um, because of that, you feel like you're you're tapping into another uh, level of your capacity as an artist. And, and I think with Pearl, watching that movie Saturday, having a, a little separation from it, it was really cool. It was just like, it, I was able to really, really enjoy the movie. My wife, who had not seen any of it was was pretty blown away by it and it's she's not a horror movie type gal and she was taken with the movie so that made me feel really good too like that hey man we're doing a good thing here you know this is really good work so i mean i think if there's any justice uh mia goth 
absolutely deserves a Best Actress nomination for Pearl. Um, from what I remember, what my mind can recover, I think maybe Martin Scorsese was affected by it slightly less than I was, uh, is that there's no music over the, the the big monologue in the film. But in the ending, obviously, you've got this like this almost naked gun on steroids <laughs> final shot of her, you know, of just this expression. Uh, usually, you know, when you score stuff, you're scoring the action moving action but in this it, it almost seems like it's three minutes of just over someone quivering to keep it together what was the challenge of shooting that sequence and scoring that where you're just basically scoring someone trying with a straight face literally well shooting it weirdly was not very challenging i mean certainly for me i didn't have to do anything but uh, i i um i had this idea on a whim I mean, the plan was that she was going to smile and it was going to freeze frame on sort of a sad moment in her smile and say the end. And it was going to sort of match the freeze frame that happens at the title of the movie in the beginning of the film. And um, I don't know why, but on the day, I just had this weird idea that I was like, hey, this is what I want to do. But I'd rather you hold it for like a little bit longer so I can find the right moment of like, you know, your expression in the smile that can sort of say a lot with from one image. And I was like, but it might be kind of interesting to see how long you could hold it and do sort of an organic freeze frame and just see what that's like and see what happens. And, and me, it was game to try it. And so we set up to do it and she said her line and she smiled and I was watching behind the monitor and I just didn't cut. I just kept watching her and I don't think she knew what she was going to do and I didn't know what she was going to do. And it was really just this like, well, what's going to happen next? And then it went on for about three minutes. And then I was like, I have enough. And I, I cut and I just was like, that's the end credits of the movie. I mean, that was amazing. And we only did it that one time. So it was a one time thing, dropped it in the edit and that was it. And, um, you know, from a music standpoint, for me, it was sort of a culmination of the movie. So it, need to, it needed to be a, uh, uh, a culmination of the sort of orchestral score and the tone of the film we'd seen thus far. And then it needed to segue into the sort of, sadness behind what was going on and segue into what her future would be. And if people are aware of X, that it would be darker and that, you know, all was not right, despite, you know, what she was um, showing on the outside. And even to the degree that when that shot is over and we get into the end credits, by the very end of the credit sequence, we even get into the actual music from X. And so it felt like a good way to sort of conclude one movie and slowly bridge the gap towards what her future would be. What was the challenge for you, Tim Tyler, of just, of just playing all that inner turmoil? Well, uh, <clears throat> Ty had actually sent us a very cool idea with two mashed up tones. One was kind of uh, the happy ending and one was this kind of very creepy dissonant. And so actually when, when we scored it, there was like a, we had two, there were two versions in the Pro Tool session and two versions we recorded. One is this big sort of, happy Hollywood ending. And then the other one is, is all the dissonance that takes you in and takes you out of it. And uh, it was really just a question of, you know, we knew we wanted to hit, hit the big thematic moment, which is a reprise of the opening titles, but uh, the, the whole choice of where does it sort of shift from one, the, the happy moment to the, to the, the darker stems um, was really something that uh, Ty had control over and, and, and worked in the dub, but we had we had we recorded two two diff completely different tones and knew knew they were going to be just beautifully kind of mashed together and have have uh, have that crossover into something pretty horrific. I will say that finding this the transition was was challenging also because you know the version that stayed big the whole time in many ways was more satisfying because it was like a beautiful um, big ending to the score. Um, but the the creative effect that it had, even though it was really entertaining and great and, and bombastic and it was all of the things coming together, it 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 felt like it was making fun of her after mm -hmm. after a certain point. And so if you didn't transition into sort of the darker stuff, it was like it it had this weird effect of making it seem like, oh, we're laughing at her, which is of course not the goal of the movie. And so finding that time to shift from we're culminating this one movie and then we're letting you know what's really going on beneath the surface was really, I mean, it was one of the last things in the mix too, of just really trying to finesse it and get it just right to be like, if it was 30 seconds later, the transition between the orchestra falling apart and the, and the darker stems coming up didn't quite work. If it was 20 seconds earlier, it was too soon. So it was really finding just the right part based on also what she was doing. And so that was one of those instances where having the stems was really great 
because we didn't really change anything. We didn't we didn't do anything with the stems to affect the creative intent of the music, but it was just being able to be like, ooh, if we can start this crossfade here, these two things won't rub against each other and it will be a smoother handoff that you didn't know was happening until you were already in it. And that was what was great. Even earlier when, when Tim was saying for some of the dance sequences that we stemmed out, nothing in the stems really changed any of the composition. The really only benefit on my end in the mix with a very rich sound design was to make sure horns weren't rubbing against sound effects or something like that. And in, in some of those cases, if you only had it all in the 60 some piece orchestra, you'd lose some strings also by trying to EQ something or bring like something down four dB and you lose something you don't want to lose. Um, and because really all you're trying to do is stop some rubbing between the footsteps of the people on the stage dancing and the way the, the percussion was hitting or something like that. So um, there wasn't really any instances where we sort of altered. We just were always trying to protect that the, the scope of the score would always come through. Now we've got a question from Maxwell Stone, a filmmaking question for you, Ty. Uh, congratulations, team, on a beautiful film and score. Ty, what was your favorite part about filming out New Zealand? The, the crew, the food, the culture, the creative inspiration. Did anything stand out? All of it did. I mean, New Zealand was a real wonderful experience for me. I, I went there to go there for three months to make a movie. And I ended up being there for 13 months and did all the posts there. And so um, I really was very embedded in, in, in New Zealand. And I, we had the most amazing crew. Um, I'm still very close with a lot of them and it was a really great experience and we were we were based out of Wellington which is you know one of now one of my favorite cities in the world um, I had such a great experience working there working at Park Road which was Peter Jackson's post facility that was really amazing um, the food is great um, really good oysters um, and then even in Wanganui where we were making the film um, we just had even down to the people who whose property it was we got along great and it was like a, a very like a family affair type experience working there. And it was, um, it was such a pleasure. And, and we're, I'm so fortunate that it worked out the way that it did. And I, you know, I would, I would happily go back to New Zealand both to visit or to work, you know, in a heartbeat. It was really great. So now we've got a question from Matthew Clark, all three of you. How do you deal with writer's block? Well, I don't know. I mean, I think that writing is one of those things that for me, I mean, it's, it's no fun. So, and there's this idea that you're going to be struck by inspiration and it's just going to effortlessly flow. I've never had that happen. I mean, some days you're more inspired than others, but to me, I look at it a little bit like exercise and, um, you know, exercise is one of those things. It's not that hard to do it, but it's really easy not to do it. And if you do do it, it will get easier and you will get better at it. You just have to do it. Um, and I think that way about writing is that for me, it's like, you just have to sit down and start writing and know that it's going to be bad for most of the time. And then eventually, if you put the time in, we'll get good. And I think that's that's hard because, you know, you might have a moment where you can write anywhere from 10 to 30 pages in a day and feel so inspired. And then you're going to hit the wall where the sort of insecurities and the second guessing and all that stuff comes in. Then you have to just kind of build the muscle to power through that because it's never for me, it's never just come out in one chunk effortlessly good done. It's always been I write a draft of a movie that's bad, but now I have a draft of a movie, so I can just make it better versus what yesterday or something where I didn't have one at all. And so I think as long as you just kind of put the time in and keep chipping away at it, you'll get there. You just have to kind of force yourself to do it, for me anyway. Tim and Tyler, how, how do you deal with composer's block? Well, we have a finite amount of time to do our job. And if we don't get it done, well, then someone else will be doing our job. <laughs> but, you know, uh, to Ty's point, um, years ago, Stephen Pressfield wrote a book uh, called The War of Art, and he discusses this in that book. And it's about it's about showing up to your job as a writer, a creator every day and being willing to suffer through forcing yourself to do something. But making sure that you put your time in every day so that you can achieve your objective. And yeah, some of it's going to be total garbage. Um, you hope that you have the time to go back and revise your work so that you don't feel that way about it when you have to let it go. That's something we deal with too. Um, but I do think it's the repetition and the commitment to the work. And it is, as Ty said, it's, it's good to put some paint on the canvas and at least then you have, uh, a reference point to work from and, and you can then start to see uh, how you can improve your ideas uh, all throughout from 
you know, the beginning to the end. So uh, it's important just to do it. I don't think inspiration just strikes while you're driving your car and you have the whole thing. I mean, sometimes we do have ideas come to us that way, but that's not a process you can consider for a, a career, in my opinion. I think you have to do the work. Now we've got a question from uh, Dale for you, Tyler. Your use of the guitar viol is legendary, even recently employing it in your collaborations with Jerry Cantrell on his new solo album. Is this axe used in X and Pearl? And if so, details, please. Uh, well, actually, I used the guitar viol uh, only on Jerry's live tour. We we opened the show with a pass, passage that I would like improvise every night. The guitar viol is an X. Um, it's part of the stew of sound in that movie. Uh, Pearl is is entirely traditional um, and it's in all of its instrumentation. So the guitar viol would not uh, work in that score very naturally. But we use it, you know, we use it wherever we can. You know, one thing that's interesting that really struck me, um, you know, again, when you compare the, the kind of grit and kind of twisted eroticism of X to the smoothness of Pearl. And X, maybe you have maybe just a little bit less sympathy to the people who are rapidly getting decimated. But it really struck me in Pearl that, you know, these people, for the most part, really don't ask to get so horribly killed. You know, you even even the the the, the guy, the projectionist, you feel bad for him. How does that musically present a difference? And maybe you're more sympathetic to, at least I was, to the victims in Pearl than I was to the victims in X. Yeah, um, I, I think uh, you know, right from the right from the DNA of of the score, you, you have these, these themes and, and the story is, is one where you really feel, I mean, I, I've, I've never felt such uh, sympathy or connection to, um, to a, to a serial killer as I, as I, as I do in, in Pearl. I mean, she just captured my heart and all the characters cap capture your heart in that movie. And I think that that, um, you you want the music to connect the audience to those characters and make them really feel. I, you feel for every character in the movie. You feel for the mom. You you understand her. You feel for the dad. You feel for all the characters. And I think that was very much. It's very much there in the film. So we wanted to capture that in the score and really and really have that emotion. Um, for me, some of the most satisfying horror films are films where you really connect with the characters because you care about them. You care about their destiny. You, there's, there's jeopardy, there's stakes. And, um, that, that for me is often what, 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 uh, separates for me a, a film you just don't care about to a film where you, you really invested, uh, in the characters and you, you really want, I mean, even in the audition, you, you want Pearl to succeed and it's, 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 it's heart crushing when she does it. Yeah, we don't judge, Daniel. It seems, like you're, <laughs> it seems like you're judging the characters in X because I didn't want to see any of them die. Maybe, oh, maybe I'm a bit moral. <laughs> oh, come on, man. I mean, the point is, is everybody is complicated and they have their origin story. In X, Pearl, the character, is at the end of her life and she, her, her dreams have been dashed for a long time at that point. So she's in a much different state of mind than the young Pearl in the movie Pearl. But honestly, you know, it's real easy to cast a judgment on people when we see a snapshot or a headline. But if we understood their complete story in their life and everything, every person and experience that's intersected uh, their experience, I think we would be a little bit more understanding as opposed to judgmental. And, and for us, like on the music side, as storytellers or filmmakers, we're not judging. I mean, we're our whole point is just to tell the story, to uh, understand the characters the best we can. What do you think, Ty? Do you think people are more sympathetic to the characters in X or Pearl? Well, I mean, I think Pearl is like a, a, a very character-driven movie, whereas X is an ensemble and is a sort of atmosphere uh more of a plot driven movie in a way whereas whereas pearl is very much a movie about putting you in pearl's head and her experience and aligning you with her so 
I think that there's naturally going to be a little bit more like empathy and, and connection to her because she's in every frame of the movie and it's it's her story and we're just along for the ride. Whereas X, there's a bigger movie at play. Now, of course, you've got the, the Pearl universe going on. Stick for the end credits and you get a little uh, teaser for Maxine. Uh, are we going to get disco music in the score? I'm or, get... or techno I, or it, uh, Jan Hammer? <laughs> it'll be different, but we... Um... You know, we were able to keep Pearl a complete secret miraculously for a year, having made it. And we sort of announced to the world at South by Southwest at the X premiere that that movie even existed. And that was a very fun, exciting way to reveal that. And then we were able to keep Maxine a secret all the way until the Toronto Film Festival about two weeks ago and announced it there. And that was a very fun secret to keep. So I think staying in line with things, I'm going to be pretty um, hush hush on any details. Um, about, but it will be very different in the sense that X and Pearl are very different movies. Maxine will be different from the other two as well. What, 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 any ideas just stating uh, Tim and Tyler? It's not to be <laughs> spoken of. <laughs> 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 well, I mean, so I, I guess uh, for my final question for all of you, I mean, how do you think that these scores have and these movies have kind of reinvigorated the, you know, for the lack of a terrible word, the slash or the mad killer genre, as it were? I mean, I don't know to, to what degree it has done it, that, but I know that in my travels from, you know, March until now with both of these movies coming out, um, there are no shortage of people talking about the music in both movies. And that's not always the case with movies, you know? And so, especially for a modern audience who's not necessarily thinking about the different crafts of filmmaking, um, to see as many people as there are specifically highlighting the music in the movies and and how effective they are and how much they like them and, and just even us having, you know, soundtracks that we're selling out of and things like that. It's really, it's, it's both cool and satisfying and it's just, it's nice to see people, um, you know, appreciating all the work that we put in. What do you think, uh, Tim and Tyler? I mean, it's always great when you write something and people notice it and connect with it. I mean, that that's, you know, that's that's something that, that we all aspire to. And if you can write something that even touches one or two people, that's it's satisfying. So satisfying, you know. I had yeah, no I shortage mean, of I, mayhem, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, we're again, at the end of the day, it's about the movie. It's about the story. And and if we can serve that with uh, an intriguing enough approach that people uh, find the music interesting enough to not only feel during the experience and helps the story resonate with them more deeply, but actually go back and and listen to it as a standalone body of work. I think that oftentimes is a, is a great compliment to the filmmaking itself because to yield a, a great score, almost always you're gonna you're gonna it's gonna come from a great experience a collaborative experience with the director based on interesting material based on a conversation that uh, uh about music that is that is compelling and is going to draw that uh next level of creative uh you know con uh concepts and focus from a composer as opposed to saying so yeah, I want uh, this, this, and this. As a matter of fact, uh, just do something like that movie. Where you know that's one of the great joys of working with Ty. I mean, I I can't speak for him, but it's he he doesn't really seem to care in the context of his movie what's going on in other movies. We all see it, we all recognize it, we appreciate great work, but we're making this movie. You know, and that's what I love about it. It's not an approach like, hey, we need to make this so everybody loves it. We hope everyone loves it, but it can't be made with under that guise. You know, it has to be made uh, as the very unique story that, that Ty has to tell. And, and me as a composer, I want to help serve that, whatever it may be. I don't, if we're banging on a trash can or we're deploying an orchestra, whatever it takes to do that, I'm cool with it. Well, and, a and a shout out to the incredible, incredible actors as well. Oh, I yeah. Mean, um, you know, great. when you when you have performances like that, it sets the bar so high. You're just like, you know, you want to do it justice. Yeah, we didn't have to fix anything. Well, 
All I know is that Mia Goth has to star in the remake of Homicidal. So every Joan Crawford film, I just wanted to see her remake them. Uh, Tyler, Timothy, and Ty, I just want to thank you all so much for joining us at Film Music Live. Watch Pearl in theaters and Exxon Video with both soundtracks available on A24 Music. I want to give a big thanks to A24's Gabby Edzi, Pamela Ebica, and Sherpa Gupta. And our show producer, Dale Turner, Mark Northam, and Mark Banning. And I'll see you all on the next Film Music Live. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.